Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Bijan Kimirgar. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Research at Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Um, it's really a pleasure to be joined by so many of you to share with you information from the new Keeping Track of New York City's Children data book. Um, before we get started into the presentation and later the discussion, I just wanted to share with you some information that might be useful to you during uh, the webinar. Uh, this is a screenshot of what you're probably looking at or will be looking at. Um, I just wanted to say that at the bottom, there's an option for you to click on the Q&A button. And at any point during the presentation, you can share a question that we will answer either in the chat or verbally at the end of the slide presentation. So at any point, you can write those down. Um, also, at the end of the presentation, everyone will have a chance to, in addition, ask questions in the Q&A to raise their hand if they would like to say something verbally. Um, and also, the um, audio settings are on the bottom left uh, portion of your screen. And you can adjust that, your microphone, um, as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to send a chat. Um, Carlos Rosales, uh, who is part of the CCC team, will be helping me and co-facilitating today's webinar. So with that, um, I'd just like to say a few things about the data book. Um, you know, this is a webinar that's going to focus on the 2020 edition of the Keeping Track of New York City Children data book. It highlights how citywide we have seen improvements in child and family well-being, but we shouldn't let this dictate how we think about um, the conditions that children and families face. We also know that when we disaggregate the data by different demographic groups or when we look at issues by different neighborhoods, you see a very different picture where families are struggling and need supports in various ways. I think that the current conversation around the 2020 census, which is what this data book uh, really speaks to, and, and I'll share in a moment how we highlight the 2020 census in the book. Uh, the census is a way for us to understand the conditions that families face in New York City and nationwide, but it is also a tool for allocating funding for critical programs that families rely on. And when we think about the current crisis around the, the public health uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic, pandemic, um, we see how important it is to have accurate information about everyone who's living in the city, as well as the uh, information to support funding for critical programs that were important before the public health crisis, but are even more important now, um, where families are facing even greater economic precarity and security than uh, just a few weeks ago. So I just want to introduce to you a few members of the team who will be presenting with you today. Um, again, my name is Bijan Kimigar. I'm Associate Executive Director for Research, and it's my pleasure to be working with several colleagues on this book, including Sophia Halkidis, who's a data analyst, and will be sharing with you information specific to the 2020 census and the undercount of young children. Uh, Jack Mullen and Maria Drobniak. Uh, Jack is a research associate and Maria Drobniak is a senior research associate. They will be tag teaming key findings from several of the chapters of the data book and will provide uh, just the highlights and we invite you to go deeper. Um, we will we'll share a link during the webinar where you can download the data book and go into much more depth than we're able to because of the time we have uh, with you all today. Um, we also are recording this webinar today, so we'll share with you a recording afterwards as well if there's any part that you want to go back to. So with that, I'll give you an overview of the data book and then pass it on to my colleagues. And I just want to say, you know, the keeping track of New York City's children has been something that CCC has produced for nearly 30 years, the first one being in 1993. Throughout this time, we have really produced it as a way as a desk reference for uh, government officials, for the philanthropic community, for academics, um, for community-based organizations, those are providing direct services to children and families, and uh, for New Yorkers at large to really have the most up-to-date information on how children and, family and their families are faring, um, and to really monitor uh, trends, both worrisome trends and welcome trends. 
uh, we use the most up-to-date or the most recent information available from dozens of government and administrative sources. So this means that we're using the most recent uh, data from the census, the American Community Survey in 2018, which is the most recent data that we have available. Um, but in some situations, data from Department of Education, Department of Health is slightly more recent from 2019. And we include those um, in the book. Um, the book uh, is also complemented by our online database, data.cccnewyork.org. And this is the place that you can really dive deep in an interactive way and look at all of the information that we're sharing with you in the data book for many more uh, indicators and potentially uh, the community district level data when the data book might focus on the citywide information. Um, this year, the data book was really uh, designed as a resource for census advocacy. Uh, the 2020 census is currently underway. It started uh, March 12th, and on April 1st, we have a census day. Um, CCC has been doing a lot of advocacy, and we're joined, like I said, by Carlos uh, Rosales and uh, potentially other folks from CCC uh, who are joining this webinar. And uh, at, if there's any questions around our census advocacy at the end of the presentation, we can also, um, Carlos can jump in and answer those questions. But briefly, we launched a, what we call our Every, Count, Every Child Counts NYC campaign last year, which was had multiple prongs. And this book uh, tries to highlight the importance of this advocacy to ensure that every person in New York City is counted, but especially uh, children under, the five, under five years of age who are the most likely not to be counted. And there's many factors that makes that the case. And we dig into that into the book. Uh, and Sophia Halkidis will be describing this in more detail. Um, we also illustrate in the book how funding for many programs and services that children and families rely on come from the census and that in order to have the most accurate information about children and families in the city, we need to have an accurate and complete census count. And this is no more important as it is right now with the current public health crisis and just trying to understand the sheer number of people who might need different uh, emergency services, but then in the months to come, uh, those that will need additional support services to face uh, the challenges that they may have already been facing, but to a now deeper extent. Um, the introduction of the data book goes through some of the information on the census, and I'll leave it to Sophia to get into that uh, for you. And Maria and Jack will be going over information on several chapters of the data book. We look at demographics of who are New York City's children, their economic security, the housing conditions which they live in, the health and mental health and educational outcomes that they have. And we also look at specific indicators for young people, what we call youth, and the context of family and community. We provide 65 geographic profiles, one for the city, one for each of the five boroughs, and one for all 59 community districts that are part of each of the boroughs in the city. Um, we, here we try to pick out several indicators that are critical for a quick look of understanding of how children and families are faring. And uh, Sophia will get into more about some of the data points that we focus on in terms of what make households hard to count. So with that, it's my pleasure to uh, trend, uh, turn it over to Sophia, who's gonna be going over the undercount of young children in the decennial census. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Bijan, for the intro. Um, I'm just gonna get right started. So the decennial census is really critical to CCC's mission to see every New York City child healthy, housed, educated, and safe. And um, since 1970, the Constitution has required that a census be administered every 10 years with the goal of counting every living person in the United States. However, not everybody is counted including and especially young children under the age of five. As you see here on the slide, since 1950, the census undercount for the population at large has improved considerably, while the undercount for children and especially the undercount of young children has worsened. And we know this through a combination of birth records, death records, and net migration estimates. Um, and what you see on this chart is the net undercount. This is the percentage of people specifically under the age of 18 who were living, who were living in the United States at the time of the decennial census, but were not counted on the form for a variety of reasons. In the 2010 census alone, more than 1 million young children under the age of five 
in the nation were not counted, making ch young children the most undercounted age group. And tens of thousands of young children were missed in 2010. Hundreds of thousands live in households in New York City that are risked at risk of being missed in 2020, which is ongoing now. Um, in New York City, approximately 70,000 young children were not counted in 2010, and this is shown here on the borough-wide chart on the left. And in 2018, there were more than 530,000 children under the age of five. And among them, there's not one reason why children are undercounted. It is possible that a parent or guardian didn't complete their census form or that their household was missed entirely due to incomplete housing records. However, mostly the undercount is due to the fact that children are really overrepresented in households with characteristics that make them hard to count. Some of these factors are listed here on the right side include lack of internet access, limited English proficiency, having moved in the past year, living in a household with seven or more people, living in a low income household, or living in a rental household. All different households that are in abundance in our big city. For children under five, who are the hardest to count age group, these other factors are compounding. As a matter of fact, in 2010, only one in five children was missed because their families did not return the census form while four in five families returned the form but did not include the young child on it. And, you know, as Bajan mentioned, we really hope that this book can serve as a resource to communities and as a springboard for advocacy, especially for those doing census work through August. And we created this publication with that goal in mind. So on the left here, you see a map of the share of the population in poverty by census tract. And this is available on our geographic profiles um, and an and um, for every community district and borough in the city. And it also identifies um, those without internet connection or limited English proficiency, which are also barriers to a complete count. And on the right side is a census tract level map of the hard to count census tracts in New York City. Census tracts are just small geographies with populations between 2,500 to 8,000 people. The orange on the map represents the hard to count tracts in 2010. And Hard to count tracts in this context were the census tracts where the census response rate was below, was among the bottom 20% in the country. In New York City, this represents more than 60% of tracts. Almost 5 million New Yorkers live in a hard to count census tract and nearly 350,000 children under the age of five live in a hard to count census tract. And a fair and accurate census is really critical to the well-being of children and families. Um, the census count has really far-reaching implications, not only you know, today, but for the next 10 years, which is most of a child's childhood. One of the most impactful purposes of the census is the allocation of funding for federal programs, many of which are aimed to support children and families. In fiscal year 2017 alone, New York State received $121 billion through federal spending programs guided by 2010 census data, which include vital housing, nutrition, education, and health programs like SNAP like federal housing subsidies, Head Start, the National School Lunch Program, and Medicaid, programs that work to ensure that children are healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Another fundamental purpose of the census is to distribute the 435 seats in the House of Representatives among the 50 states, which impacts the way that communities' needs are represented and prioritized. Um, and it's just really critical that we have the response rate of 100%. Currently, we're at 16.8% for New York City to ensure that our children have access to the programs and resources which elevate and support them and their families, to make sure that they have a voice in electing leaders who are going to make critical decisions about their futures and will champion for them at the federal level, level, and to make sure that they have allies who are advocating for their needs using accurate data. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. And now we'll turn it over to Jack and Maria. We'll go over key findings from some of the chapters in the data book. Thanks, Bijan. Hey, everyone. This is Jack speaking. So in the next series of slides, Maria and I would like to highlight a few key findings and takeaways out of the abundance of data that this book is presenting. We'll be walking through different domains of child and family well-being. And for each domain, we'll share an overview of the topics covered, a snapshot of key findings and accompanying visuals that illustrate the facts, but above all, we want to emphasize how these data are deeply connected to the 2020 census. So starting with economic security. This chapter presents data on the labor market and labor force, 
on incomes and poverty levels, and I'll go over these in a moment, as well as income supports like food stamps. In terms of the key takeaways, I'll be going over the data points in detail, but I wanna stress that on issues of economic security, the decennial census is instrumental to providing support for children and families in New York City. For example, the decennial census is the basis for determining the amount of federal funding that goes to states for programs that support economic stability, such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP or food stamps, as well as temporary assistance for needy families or TANF. In fiscal year 2016, the state of New York received close to 7 billion with a B for these two programs alone based on the 2010 census count. Going into some of these takeaways, one positive trend is that child poverty is declining and has returned to its pre-recession level. Unfortunately, that was and is an already unacceptably high level at one in four children citywide. And this is according to the federal poverty threshold in, for which in 2017 was roughly $25,000 for a family of four. Further, when we consider a more holistic threshold of poverty, as we know this is an act, totally the case in New York City, we can see the ways in which anti-poverty programs are protecting some families from deprivation, but also the magnitude of families living near poverty. So take a look at the NYC Gov poverty level from the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. This accounts for government transfers like tax credits and food stamps, as well as the cost of housing, the cost of childcare, transportation, and other factors. This measures how some government transfers may be lifting some children out of deep poverty. The row shaded in orange highlights 21% of children compared to the 25% in the federal poverty level. But look at the row shaded in blue. The share of children living in or near poverty, that is below $50,000 a year for a family of four, is more than half of all children citywide. So for families experiencing economic insecurity, SNAP remains a critical resource. While caseloads overall are declining since the height of the recession, nearly 900,000 families participated in the program in 2019. And a key observation regarding SNAP that we want to point to is that data from the New York City Department of Social Services show that caseloads are declining particularly among non-citizen families. These are individuals who may remain eligible, but fear that participation in pro public programs threatens a pathway to citizenship for themselves or a family member. This is something we've heard in conversation with service providers and community members on the ground, particularly through our community-based assessment in Elmhurst and Corona in Queens. Moving on to housing. So in the housing section, we examine housing affordability, including rents and the rent burden, housing conditions and homelessness with an eye towards families with children in shelter. And when it comes to takeaways, we wanna drive home that funding for affordable housing programs that support low-income families, such as Section 8 vouchers, the Low-Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, as well as money for NYCHA through the Public Housing Capital Fund. All these programs and so many more are contingent on achieving a complete count in the 2020 census. In terms of the key takeaways, since 2005, the growth in median rents has outpaced the growth in median income substantially. The chart on the left shows a citywide gap of 21% in rent versus just 12.5% growth in median incomes over that time. What's the consequence of rising rents uh, for, for New York City? It means really that those living in poverty are particularly squeezed. The burden of rising rents is borne especially by those below 100% of the federal poverty level. And you can see in the bar on the right, two thirds of those living below 100% of federal poverty level are paying more than half of their income towards rent, what is referred to as severely rent burdened. Furthermore, CCC knows very well that the affordability crisis and the homelessness crisis are really two sides of the same coin. Since 2010, the number of families with children in homeless shelters grew 50%, totaling 44,000 in 2018. This is two thirds of the 60,000 individuals living in New York City shelters. One positive trend to note concerning the overall rate of shelter re-entry or returning to shelter within a year of leaving, the chart on the right shows that over the last decade, the general rate of re-entry for families with children has declined from 10% to 7%. However, when we disaggregate these exits based on families who receive subsidies upon exiting versus those who did not receive subsidies upon leaving, we see the alarming figure of one in four families who exit shelter without a subsidy will return to the system within a year. With that, I'm gonna let my colleague Maria Drobniak take over to talk about data on health and mental health. Thank you, Jack, and hello, everyone. 
<clears throat> focusing on health and mental health chapter. In this chapter, we cover the data on health insurance, in particular uninsured children, infant health indicators, indicators on asthma, disabilities, and early intervention, and I'll come back to that in a few slides. And lastly, uh, data on mental health. And one of the key takeaways I will draw your attention on is really the census supports the health of New York City children and families by distribution of federal funds for programs like health insurance, Medicaid, Medicare and CHIP, community services block grant, and healthcare centers, among the others. Additionally, census data is used to plan for hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, and the location and funding for other health services. And I will go over the key data takeaways in the next couple of slides. Health insurance in 2018 was almost universal, and just 2.5% of all children under 19 were uninsured. However, this still means that 46,000 of children in New York City. And as the bar charts show on the right side, uh, those of, of those children who are uninsured, they are primarily Asian children and children who are non-citizens. And focusing on the map on the left side, we do see children under 19 without health insurance by community district. And the darkest shade of blue is showing the neighborhoods where the rate of uninsured children is much higher than the average citywide, which goes like from 5.2% to 9%. In Queens, we have a neighborhoods of Flushing and Bayside and neighborhoods of uh, Murray Hill and Stuyvesant in Manhattan. And moving on to the early intervention services and as our uh, next uh, key takeaway, the early intervention programs provi provide evaluations and services to infants and toddlers under the age of three with, develop with developmental delays or disabilities. And as we all know, these first few years of life present a critical window opportunity for addressing those. CCC always kept close eye on this issue in our most uh, recent analysis that we published with Advocates for Children this past fall shows that 30% of all children, of children on average, do not get early intervention services as required by law, which means within 30 days of their individualized family service plan meeting. Uh, another addressing the two major drop-off points in early intervention process is really key to ensuring equitable and timely access to critical developmental supports. And you can focus now on the chart on the right, where we have uh, two points. One is really what happens in the process when child is referred to services and until being evaluated. It is the orange circle in the chart, which says drop off from referral to evaluation. And we can see that uh, black children are, they have the highest drop off rate of 16.5% of all of the racial and ethnic groups. And the second point in this cycle of receiving services is like, from the moment that children, the child is determined to be eligible to service, what happens? How many children drop off from being eligible to getting services? And here we can focus on race circles and they are really showing that children of across all minority groups, Black, Asian and Hispanic, have much higher drop off rate from eligibility to services compared to white children. And uh, the report overall found that uh, neighborhoods where children re referred for services but didn't get evaluated or, or didn't get them are mainly low income uh, and communities of color across the city. So I will uh, end here about the uh, health and early intervention services and I'll focus on education chapter next. <clears throat> In this chapter, we show data on early care and, edu and education system with focus on publicly funded system. We show data on student and school characteristics where we highlight findings about schools diversity and segregation, student performance with focus on disparities on math and ELA test scores, and lastly, the after school enrollment and adult education data. And the key takeaway is really that census funding is critical to, to education system as well with child care and development block grant which supports subsidized childcare, national school lunch and breakfast program, Head Start, among the others. And census data also inform where new schools are needed and where spending will go to help pay for teacher, textbooks and other expenses. And I will walk you through a couple of other findings on the following slides. <clears throat> so focusing on early care and education system, New York City has one of the largest publicly funded early care and education systems with 123,000 of children under five in 2018. And uh, looking at the bar on the left of this slide, when we think about these children who are in a publicly funded system, we need also to think about all 530 children under five in the city 
and also about the fact that uh, that half of them are in low income households which we say here below 200 percent of the federal poverty threshold or 50,000 for a family of four this really talks about the need for more services and children being able to utilize it more and the publicly funded system has expanded thanks to universal program such as pre-k and 3k and it also includes subsidized care for low-income families which is provided either through early learn or hra and acs vouchers so in the book we show data on the contracted portion of the publicly funded system which includes all of the above managed by the department of education except for vouchers when we take a look at this contracted part of the system as the pie chart shows we see that it serves four-year-olds mainly 75 percent with a minimal capacity for infants and toddlers seven percent and three percent of the system and i'll pass it on to jack for uh, the following slide thanks maria so jumping back in as the movement to integrate schools grows citizens committee for children has really been at the forefront of local efforts to measure the degree to which new york city's public schools are segregated and indeed it is a widespread issue in september we found that just 28 percent of new york city schools are diverse the map on the left illustrates how diverse schools are concentrated in specific pockets of the city, notably West Queens and South Brooklyn. But there are many ways of examining school diversity and segregation, and another way that CCC introduced more recently is school representativeness. This measures the degree to which a school's racial and ethnic enrollment represents the broader demographics of its school district. In the map on the right, we find that the districts where schools tend to be least representative of their districts are school districts two and three in Manhattan, as well as districts 27 and 28 around Jamaica and Forest Hills in Queens, and 13 and 15 in downtown Brooklyn, Fort Greene, and Park Slope and Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Back to you, Maria. Thank you, Jack. And on this slide, we are focusing on a reading and math test score. So overall, we see that half of all third through eighth grade students are meeting their grade level on math and reading uh, at around 46 and 47 percent and what we are highlighting in this table is really that while there is a vast difference in the share of students passing tests uh, meeting the grade level between those who are english language uh, learners and those who are proficient like nine percent versus 52 percent we do see better outcomes for former english language uh, learners uh, at 59 percent which are scoring like higher share of those students are meeting their grade level compared to English language proficient students, which really speaks to effectiveness and needs for support uh, services. And this is really a positive trend uh, that we were happy to highlight. On the following slide, we are really uh, diving, going back to the achievement gap, gap uh, that persists along racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic lines. So highlighted in red are reading and math test scores, share of students in uh, each racial and ethnic group. And we see that, for example, for Asian and white students, 74% uh, of Asian students and 67% of white students are meeting grade level on math tests, while for Black and uh, Latino, the share is 28 and 33%. And then we also see similar trend uh, when we break students down by those who are economically disadvantaged and those who are not. And we see that 39% of those who are uh, in an economic need are passing, 39% of students meet their grade level versus 65% of those who are not. So I will uh, end here uh, on education chapter and I'll move on to family and community. In this chapter, we cover topics such as community connections and particularly focusing on internet access today. Also, we have data on community safety, domestic violence, and we have a host of data about child welfare system and one of them being foster care that I will focus on today. And really the key takeaways, as we probably all know on this call, is that internet access is critical to this year's census operation as it is a preferred mode to completing the form. Furthermore, the census count is responsible for the allocation of funds that maintain our child welfare system, including Title IV foster care, adoption assistance, and the social services block grant. <clears throat> and uh, really, when we speak about internet access, it is really critical for a fair and accurate count. When we think about the most vulnerable New Yorkers, many living on low incomes do not have internet access, which directly imply the undercount during the current census. Roughly 50,000 children under five in household are, do live in households without internet. So if you focus now on the chart on the right, we see that 13% of all households in the city are lacking internet access. 
it is a gray bar. But when we disaggregate, disaggregate the data by income levels, we see that households, which we call in poverty for a family of four, around 25,000, uh, among those, we see that one third doesn't have internet access. The share is similar for households near poverty, where we have 21% in this uh, situation. And as income, uh, income increases, the share gets lower. Additionally, into, as we all know in today's world, internet is critical for many other aspects of life and the role of internet in connecting people to services and families that need them the most, they might have difficulty learning about those and connecting to them that might leave them out of poverty if they don't have internet access. And I will move on to the finding about, as you all know, child welfare system is very complex. And I'm drawing here your attention to the all time low number of children in foster care, which is 8,400. It decreased nearly 50% since 2009. And we, when we are discussing the decrease in foster care, we have to bring up the importance and relevance of the preventative services. One of the key protective factors in keeping children with their parents. We have around 44,000 children in preventative services. Uh, in 2018. And an, another good news is that th there has been a substantial increase in the number of foster care place, placements with kin over the last five years. So if you see uh, the chart on the right, almost half of all children are placed in foster boarding homes, 1600, but we do see increased shared, it is a lighter orange line, increased shared of children placed uh, with the kin, 1542. Uh, so I will, uh, I will end the child welfare section on this positive note and pass it on to Bijan. Thanks, Maria and Jack. Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I just want to share with you some of the topics that we include and the indicators we include in the chapter specific to youth. Um, we'll go over youth unemployment, employment and disconnection uh, data also information specific to youth justice, teen pregnancy and births, and also teen behavioral health, which is an increasing concern um, right now and something that CCC is paying close attention to in our advocacy. But as I mentioned, um, in the interest of having uh, of time and having a discussion and answering your questions, we're going to end the presentation portion of the webinar today and uh, really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, and turn to all of you for any questions or comments that you might want to share. Uh, we do see a question in the Q&A box. If you have additional questions that you would like to include, please include them there. Or if you would like to ask a question or make a comment verbally, just raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you so that you can be unmuted. I will just say that uh, we'll give folks a moment to uh, uh, answer or asks any questions that they'd like us to answer. Um, but there is a question that we had um, right now. And it's something that we've been thinking about. Uh, what do you think are the causal factors for Asian children being the largest group of uninsured children? And this is, I'm guessing, the largest group of the uh, racial ethnic demographic groups. And um, I'd like uh, Sophia Halkidis, uh, who has spoken with um, Alice Bufkin, who is our uh, Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health, on some speculation on why this is the case. It is definitely a topic that requires more investigation, but she has uh, some, some thoughts based on what Alice has, has shared. So I'll pass it over to her. Hi there, it's Sophia. Um, and that's a great question. Um, as Bajan mentioned, I, I did touch base with our um, with Alice Bufkin, and she gave some potential suggestions as to these disproportionately high rates. One of them being that the Asian community might face significant language barriers at several stages in the care process, which includes even outreach for health insurance, um, for health insurance coverage, but also um, reaching providers that speak their language. Another suggestion um, brought forth by Alice is, and you know, one that's on the top of all of our minds is about the public charge legislation. Um, we know that this has really impacted service uptake among many communities and specifically in Asian communities. Um, as a matter of fact, a local Asian newspaper that was covering public charge advised its readers to withdraw from all services, even though public charge was not in effect at the time. And this information came from a trusted source, so it had a visible impact on service uptake in um, Asian families, and it's just one anecdotal example. 
And, and then last, I would just mention that we do know that there's a positive relationship between the insurance status of parents and their children, such that, you know, health insured parents are more likely to insure their children. And if parents aren't eligible or don't know that they're eligible for insurance, then it'll have a chilling effect on their own children's access to care. Um, studies have also shown that more recent immigrants are less likely to have health insurance. So length of time in the United States may also be a factor in this relationship. Thanks, Sophia. Um, again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to include them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them as they come in. I also see some questions coming in in the chat. So Carlos, I'll ask for your help just to monitor that and make sure that we get all of them answered as best as we can. Uh, one question that came in through uh, the chat box is, is there any information on the fate of summer youth programs? And is there any way to know about funding for any of the, uh, for those uh, summer programming. Um, <clears throat> I think that this is something that we're continuing to investigate. And we've been in conversations with uh, the Department of Youth and Community Development about uh, getting information on these programs. I want to turn it over just in case uh, Maria or Jack have some comments on this. Um, this is a component of the book that they were working on uh, specifically. I can let Maria probably speak more to the, the funding question. I mean, we do have information on the status of youth summer youth programs and current enrollment figures as of uh, 2018, fiscal year 2018. But in terms of the fate, this is something that obviously CCC, uh, as Bijan was mentioning, CCC is deeply invested in the fate of these programs. Um, and we did not provide specific information about, you know, speculation about funding. But uh, I know that Maria has been meeting with people from the Department of Youth and Community Development to see how we can uh, further explore uh, information in this regard. And I will just add like in the data book, uh, it's really like a data point which speaks to, uh, to the summer youth programs is really that throughout the school, like we see enrollment of like 126,000, but then during the summer it's around 70,000. And it's really been our advocacy and policy point for a while now where like every year we need to fight for funding for uh, summer programs. And uh, I think our focus really can be also and is, is to determine what is the need of, for the programs. We know it exists and uh, maybe just focusing on backing up the policy and advocacy with uh, stronger data if we get them from the Department of uh, Youth and Communities Services. Thanks, Maria and Jack. Um, we see a couple questions more coming in through the chat and Carlos is uh, getting more clarification on those. Um, one thing that we can turn to is a, a question, um, why did we use the term black and not African-American? This is a great question. And then uh, another question related to EI services and we'll get to that in a second, or I'm sorry, um, IEP services. Um, so in the data book, we actually use several racial ethnic categories. Um, in different data sources, they were trying to remain true to how it's reported. So if it's reported as black or if it's reported as African-American, uh, that is what we use. Um, in some situations, there might be, for example, the term uh, Hispanic or Latino, and that's used in different places depending on what is reported from the original source. Um, another question, <clears throat> why do you think that African-American children have are not receiving the EI services and that uh, reading and math scores are so low. Um, I will allow uh, Sophia to address the question around the EI services, um, having been one of the authors in the report that we released with Advocates for Children last year. Hi, again. Um, so yeah, that's a great question, and there's not really one good answer um, why. And, and again, I see that the question says not receiving EIP services. I'm going to assume that that means early intervention services, but we could also discuss um, rate, differential rates by race of IEP services, <laughs> individualized education programs, which is a, something different. But um, in line with the report um, and, you know, looking at these um, early intervention rates, by race ethnicity, we know that um, 
these data are by race and also by neighborhood, which often can't be um, disentangled. And one of the other findings of our report was that um, neighborhoods where higher percentages of children referred to EI um, are Black or Hispanic, have lower rates of completed evaluations. And just excuse me for a moment, I'm having a bit of background noise. Um, but otherwise, um, this would be a question that would be a lot easier for me to follow up with by typing the answer um, rather than answering live. And so I'm going to do that. Thanks, Sophia. Um, so there's a few more questions, uh, one which is related to the census, and it's a question that I think, Carlos, you will be able to answer. Um, the question is asking um, if landlords will know uh, who are in their apartments, and, and the question is related to the 2020 census, can they confirm the amount of people in a building? And uh, Carlos Rosales, who is our um, community engagement associate, will, uh, will give some, some information around this. Yeah, thank you, Bijan. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so essentially with this question, um, landlords and no other government uh, agency or court of law will know any personal, personally identifiable pieces of information in regards to the census. I know this has been, and um, thank you for the, asking this question as well, is one of the concerns that people have in general because we know there are many types of living situations people are in, um, both that are legal and otherwise. Um, but yes, in regards to knowing this information, landlords, businesses, courts of laws, and any uh, government agency um, do not have that type of information where, where they'll be able to know um, the number of people or who uh, is living in a particular household. Uh, and this is all outlined under Title 13 uh, of the U.S. Code, um, um, which is an oath taken by life by any Census Bureau employee. Um, so we have a couple of folks raising their hand. Um, Carlos, would you mind uh, unmuting one of them so they can uh, ask their question? I think one is named, uh, um, oh, let's see. I lost yeah. it in my uh, chat. Elizabeth? Yeah, so Elizabeth, um, you can, um, you should be able to speak now. I just unmuted you. And just make sure that you're unmuted on your end too. Okay, um, so Elizabeth, I've unmuted you, but if you have any issues, just um, type in the chat box or you could enter your question there. Latoya Legrand, um, I'm unmuting you as well because you've raised your hand with a question. Okay, I'll message you the both individually, but Bijan, I would um, suggest going on to the next question while I chat with them. Sure, thanks, Carlos. Um, so we have a few more questions coming in and uh, a lot, of, actually quite a few. So if we don't uh, get to you immediately uh, today during the webinar, we will follow up with you individually, uh, given that you've RSVP'd and we can uh, explain in full um, any ideas that we have to uh, answer your questions. Um, <clears throat> one, one question was regarding uh, internet access. Are there 29% of low-income households without internet access due to inability to afford access or not accessible to their physical household and, or apartment? Um, this is a good question. It's something that is kind of specific to how the census asks the question. Um, and I will leave it to, I think, Jack, you'll, you have... Um, you've worked with this recently, might have seen how the question is asked on the census form. If you can give some background as to what that information is. I know, Sophia, you've also worked with this, these data pretty closely. 
Um, and we have more information actually on our database data.cccnewyork.org, which also talks about um, whether households have internet access just through their phone or through a computer, uh, a PC. So Jack or Sophia, if you want to jump in on this at all. Right, I think Bijan did summarize the extent of the, the data we have at our disposal, which is unfortunately not able to uh, determine whether internet access is a matter of affordability or um, the infrastructure in their household or apartment. But we are able to, to, to get information from, directly from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey as to whether uh, internet access is being provided through broadband uh, or through mobile uh, data plans. Um, and this is something we've been monitoring and, and particularly keeping in mind with uh, an eye towards census outreach and the ability to um, promote the digital um, first strategy of completing the census form. So moving on to another question. Thank you, Jack. Um, are there resources available that can be sent to our offices for the public to take is a question that just came in. Um, I will say yes. And in addition, I, I will say something kind of important that I didn't mention at the top. Uh, this is the first edition of keeping track that we're making available digitally. In the past, we've printed out thousands of hard copies of the books and distributed it to many offices and organizations around the city. And the data have been available on our online database, but in addition to the data book itself, we're actually including a lot of information for the public to take. Um, hopefully it's relevant to your offices. I'm not sure what type of office it is, but especially on the census. And um, if you go to CCC's website, we have a page on uh, Every Child Counts NYC that has census related resources. Um, I will let Carlos uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, and also, Carlos, if you can address this question around how are people encouraged to participate in census data gathering? Um, I think this is something kind of important that we want everyone to know um, the different ways that they can participate. And I think that's, yeah, I'll let Carlos uh, reply to this. Sure. Uh, thank you, Bijan. So um, in regards to census resources available, CCC, um, has created a number of different tools and resources, uh, and this can all be shared with um, everyone in the follow-up message as well, if you, um, if you don't write enough to record these links. Um, first, we have our campaign page, Every Child Counts NYC, uh, which goes through um, some of the basics about what the census is, uh, the undercount of young children, and why. Um, uh, in more detail. Um, this data book uh, equally provides that information as well. Um, and then there are a number of different resources. One, community district profiles in which you can see, look at some of the indicators um, that make a particular community at risk for not being counted. Um, for example, um, no access, limited access to internet uh, or broadband internet. <laughs> Um, in addition, our census um, page has uh, a resource area where you can get some of the most um, critical documents relevant um, for the 2020 census uh, and the counting of young children. Um, and just to reiterate, um, I think again, highlighting what um, Bijan was noting in the other part of the question, there are multiple ways one can complete their 2020 census form. Um, the three ways are online by visiting my2020census.gov by phone, um, and that phone number is, I'm sorry, give me one second. Um, um, that phone number is 844-330-2020. Uh, and that is available in English, but also 12 other languages. Um, and there's a link um, that we can also share with you that lets you know what are the direct lines for those different languages. Um, and then the third way is that by April 16th, any homes that, who still haven't completed their 2020 census form by that point are going to get a bilingual, uh, meaning in English and Spanish, 
paper version of the census form that they can fill out and mail back. So knowing that, you know, people are staying at home or there's a concern about going outside and um, uh, for large public gatherings, um, people can still complete their census form in the comfort and safety of their own homes. Uh, and there's a number of different resources available to support folks who are having issues completing their form or have questions about completion that they can still access either online, by phone, uh, and by connecting with us and a number of different providers out there who are providing the support. Uh, and the last thing I wanna mention, cause I see this question listed uh, in the chat box. Um, there was a question about um, the census timeline and if there's going to be an extension with that. The answer is yes. On March 20th, the Census Bureau provided information um, that details how their operations are going to be shifted based on the COVID-19 response. Um, essentially, uh, several of the different activities or operations as part of that it is a part of the census um, will either be extended, delay, or both be suspended and extended in the case of door knocking and enumeration visits, um, because right now um, the guidance is that um, uh, people do not gather in large uh, spaces or have a lot of close uh, contact uh, due to the current situation. That timeline that um, and the document that explains that timeline in more detail, uh, we can also uh, provide to you all. Um, yeah. Anything else uh, that I missed um, or was that everything? I think you got it all. And there was part of one of the questions was just uh, emphasizing how important this early response period is. Yes. And uh, we also have information on what the uh, response rate has been for, actually this is, the Census Bureau has this for every part of the country. Um, I think that it's re it's really critical that people answer as soon as possible to prevent that. You know, the saying is ten minutes uh, prevents a door knock. So um, ten questions, ten minutes, and and you prevent someone having to come to your door. Um, Jack said uh, in the ch in the Q and A that he wanted to answer a question from Carmen about um, undocumented families. Uh, Jack, do you want to go ahead and answer that, and we'll continue to look for other questions that we can answer here. And again, if we're unable to answer your question verbally uh, we will respond to you uh, afterwards um, with with a message yes Bijan. um so there was a question i think is really important to tackle which is are there any resources for undocumented families that don't know they are eligible for food stamps and public assistance or families that think applying will be an issue with obtaining citizen status citizenship status um, and this is something that like i said it was backed up uh in 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 the research we're finding both through survey and anecdotal evidence, um, which is that really there's a chilling effect going on across New York City. That being eligible immigrant families are avoiding SNAP food stamps and, and public assistance out of fear of potential immigration co consequences. But insofar as we've heard this, it's really something that stems from the federal policies and not at the local level, not through contact with local agencies. Um, and so if you're looking for resources, I would recommend there is the Human Resources Administration offers a portal called Access HRA. Um, I can, I'd be happy to share this through email later with you as well, where you can actually put your information, which is not pertaining at all to any um, immigration status, but rather Im information of, of income and sources of money to determine your eligibility for certain programs um, and it, through a digital portal. Um, so this is something that's stemming from local initiatives that we haven't yet uh, observed any um, perceived feeling of, of a chilling effect through through local contact. But like I said, it's, it's more a matter of policies like the public charge, which are stemming from the federal government, which are the source of this, um, this issue. Thanks, Jack. Um, so one thing I just want to say as we're continuing to go through these questions, um, you know, the, I'm, I'm guessing that many of you joined us because you received an information or an, uh, a notice about this webinar because you're part of our network and you receive updates from us regularly. If you received an invitation to the webinar today and you're not part of our uh, eAction network, I really encourage you to join so you can stay up to date with everything that we're doing, not just related to the data that the research and data team are putting together in this data book and in other products, but all of our policy advocacy work and all of our civic engagement work 
as well. Um, in light of what's happening right now with COVID-19, um, the landscape is changing day by day, hour by hour, um, and it's happening at the local level, state level, and federal level, of which we're having conversations with folks that is being led by our executive director, Jennifer March, and our ex associate executive director, Risa Rodriguez, along with the policy team. So I highly encourage you to sign up for our e-action network. Um, but let's see, um, Carlos, Jack, Sophia, Maria, are there any questions that you see that you want to uh, chime in on? Uh, yes, but I would highlight um, Latoya Legrand is ready to speak and ask a question. And then I have a question relating to the census that I see as well. Okay, great. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, two questions. The first question is, will the slides be um, sent via email so that we can go over them? Yes, we'll share a recording so you'll also get the, the information that we shared verbally. Okay, great. The second question is, I don't have, I don't remember it exactly, but there was a diagram regarding the education um, with the IEP and the evaluations. I just didn't understand um, the gray part and the, and the drop-off part and the evaluation part. I just need to know what did those numbers represent? I can take that one. It's Maria. Yeah, that's it right there, right. Yes. So these numbers are presenting like drop-off. So like how many, like percentage of children, if you focus on the orange one, who were re referred to services. I mean, they, they were actually referred to evaluation, but didn't get it. It is the orange one. So it is like the first step in the process is like that you're saying you should be evaluated to see if you can receive the services and then how many children didn't make it through that step, even though they were referred, they were not evaluated. And then the gray one is once you're evaluated and you're said like, okay, this child is eligible for services, but didn't get a service. And the percentage is showing the drop off within that step which is uh, almost twice of the rate for Asian, Black, and Hispanic children compared to white. And maybe, Sophia, if you have any additional uh, insights from the report, you can chime in. But was this helpful? Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, um, I would just like to, you know, share that I, I, I noticed there's a lot of questions about these data and I'm glad to um, respond to them, you know, by email or when we send out the recording, I can, you know, uh, respond with a more comprehensive explanation of this slide. We know it's a lot of data in um, a short amount of time. I also want to direct folks, um, this, this chart and the findings from it came from a much longer report in which CCC documents, you know, these trends as well as puts forth recommendations, um, many of which are, you know, for the state and city to investigate these racial disparities themselves and to suggest, um, you know, solutions. And so in, in a lot of the questions are saying, why is this so? And we don't have one specific, very specific answer, but a few um, suggestions that I'd be glad to share and, and type up for you folks. Thanks, Sophia and Maria. Um, I know that there's a few more questions and Carlos, you wanted to jump in with a census related question. Yeah, so um, someone typed in this question, is there evidence suggesting lower reporting rates from households that consist of families that are doubled up out of fear of retaliation from landlords? Um, and I, I guess the short answer is yes, there has been, um, a great deal of ed evidence and reporting about um, not only this reason, but many re the many reasons why um, families or individuals um, do not complete their census form or leave particular individuals out of their census form. Uh, the Census Bureau has conducted this research. Um, NEAR counts and a few of uh, their national partners have also done a number of focus groups uh, and studies looking into this in particular for the 2020 census. All of this is available um, for anyone to access. Um, and I think what I can do is look at um, some of those studies and um, share with you all um, kind of the, the, the major ones that highlight um, 
and respond to this question and then also to the other reasons why um, children are missed or people are missed or left out or reasons why um, census forms are not completed. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Maria, did you want to answer one of the questions that you identified? Well, I can, I can try. Uh, there was a question uh, asking, is there a child advocacy number or department given to the parents to obtain, obtain uh, services? So I would like to say that really, as you probably know, that our focus is on providing data and supporting advocacy and policy uh, with a solid uh, information and data. So we at the CCC don't have that number, but I mean, we don't provide that type of service. But I would like to say that throughout our community-based assessments, when we were talking to parents and caregivers and youth, we did hear across all the boroughs, we did it in the North Shore uh, of uh, Staten Island, Northern part of, of uh, Manhattan and Queens in Corona and Elkhurst, that across all of these communities, parents were voicing that issue of not knowing where and how to access services. So in some cases, we, did, we, we do know that services exist, but parents do not have information on how to access them. And in some cases, services are not sufficient, which is a whole another issue. But I want to say that there is like a really strong community concern on obtaining the information. And I'm afraid that we are not like the best position to provide that. But I don't know, Bijan, if you want to add anything. Well, I, one thing that you, you said that there's, there's um, Advocates for Children does offer like a call in for education. I do support. think, I'm not sure, but I feel like, I, I, I believe so that they have yeah. a call in number. Yeah. And we can follow up on that. Yes, yeah, so we can, can definitely that. follow up on this one. Um, there's a question uh, I just want to answer. Will, are we able to disaggregate data on Asians? Um, and I think this I'm might not, be... I'm, I'm actually responding to that right now. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Um, I will just say, you know, again, the data book is a desk reference and we have it available digitally and really trying to use it as a resource for census advocacy um, over the coming weeks. Um, but then even moving beyond that, we really see this information being critical um, with the COVID-19 uh, crisis evolving. Um, I think many organizations are still in emergency response mode in, in trying to address the uh, most pressing needs and trying to address the most pressing health concerns and ensuring things like making sure students are um, receiving educational services during the emergency. But in terms of other questions that we have, um, about how this might affect families. We'll continue to monitor the situation. Uh, one question specifically for the SYP program, the Summer Youth Employment uh, Program. Um, so this is stuff, these are issues that we're going to continue to monitor. And uh, for the specific uh, question around disaggregation of, of data by race ethnicity, um, like I said, the database, data.cccnewyork.org has hundreds of indicators on child and family well-being, many more than we're able to discuss on the webinar today or even in the book. And we encourage you to take a look at that. And one of the features that we added recently was to filter all of the indicators that you can have a disaggregation by race ethnicity. So you can uh, go to the explore data section of the database and see which uh, indicators we have uh, breakdowns by race ethnicity. Um, there's also many other types of breakdowns like for by gender, um, for example. Um, but I encourage everyone to take a look at our online database. There really is a complement between the data book and the database. And the database is something that we're constantly keeping evergreen, meaning that as soon as new information is available, we try our best to get it up as soon as possible. And uh, throughout uh, this, the last few weeks, even though we've all been working remotely, the, the team has been uh, updating this with new information as it comes, becomes available. Um, so it's around two o'clock, uh, just after. I just want to use this as a breaking point uh, for folks to uh, jump off if they need to. Uh, we will share the webinar recording with everyone and we'll be following up with all of your questions. Um, if we didn't get to answer them, uh, verbally or in the chat box, we will we'll respond to you uh, by email. And again, if you found us because you uh, saw perhaps a post on social media about the webinar and you're not on our e-action 
network, please join that by uh, visiting cccnewyorkspelledout.org. Uh, and on that front page there, you can join um, our network to get updates regularly about everything we're doing, including our census advocacy that is in full swing. Um, please keep an eye out and follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. There's a lot of information uh, that we post there specific to what we're describing here, but broadly about all of the work that we're doing in our civic engagement and policy programs, policy advocacy programs as well. Um, with that, I'd just like to conclude and say thank you to everyone for joining us. And uh, please do stay in touch if you have further comments or questions. Thank you very much. And I hope all of you stay safe and healthy.